And you can be seated if you will, and I want to express my gratefulness to God for the privilege of being here and to meet uh, fellow citizens of the kingdom of God. While you people have gathered out here this morning in this brother's home to to have some fellowship together. It kind of reminds me of the early church, the way Christianity first started out. was The Bible said it's from house to house they met and broke the bread with singleness of heart. And that's what we want to have this morning while we're here is singleness of heart. One purpose, one uh, one thing that we're trying to achieve, and that is to the, fulfill the plan of God for our lives while we're here on earth. And perhaps maybe God many thousands years ago, but his, by his infinite wisdom, knew that we would be here this morning. We'd be back here on this prairie or, or desert here in the little building. He knew that thousands of years ago. Now, we met some of our friends that was coming over this morning from Tucson, the Stricker family, and uh, they had a generator to go bad in their car. And we gathered up what we could get to bring them along, the lady here and the, the children, and they're coming on a little later if they can get their generator fixed. It was some little crossroads out here. I don't know where it was at, but we're <clears throat> happy to be here. And now, uh, Brother Isaacson here, and we hardly know each other no more than just we know that we're brothers in Christ. And we have um, had times of fellowship together, and I believe our first meeting was at, uh, up in Phoenix years ago. <clears throat> and if his wife is present, I wouldn't know her. Now, that's how well we're acquainted, uh, to know who his wife is or his family. Coming in, I met one of our colored brethren standing at the door, a very fine fellow with a handshake, you know, made you kind of feel like it was just so welcome, you know, to come in and, and uh, to be uh, among this crowd like this this morning, I, it gives me a privilege. And I had the privilege of speaking in many crowded areas where they would have maybe thousands times thousands of people would gather. But I, the memorials of my ministry is times like this, when there's maybe a dozen or two sitting together. Seemingly that God deals closer to people. And I think we feel more acquainted in, and as we assemble in small gatherings. It seems like where God's Word is so, so imminent to us is when we, He said, Wherever two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in their midst. Last night, near midnight, I was just assembled with, in a home where there was a man and his wife and a young girl I was losing her mind over a little fair that had taken place. And while we were, we were assembled together, just the young lady and I in a room caused uh, the things that had to be said that was... I'd rather we'd been together. And there came this light, this angel of the Lord, and symbol right over where we were at, showing that, uh, that God keeps his promise. And yesterday, where there was a young man of 22 years old of a very prominent family, had taken the mumps, and the mumps had fell on him. And many of you adults know what that is, especially in the male uh, males. It really just almost kills them. And this boy, for several days, right on two weeks, had been running a fever of 105. Now, you know, that's in the stroking condition there. And the doctors had just simply played out all they'd had with penicillins and everything to strike that fever for that infection. But it seemed like it didn't take any effect. But in one minute's time, before God, ever speck of the fever left the young man. He rose up well. And just goes to show the main person is Christ. That's what we're here this morning in this home, is to serve Christ upon this Sabbath day. I have looked forward for the time of coming here, uh, a meeting with our precious brother, 
and you people. I have received your tidings that the brother has sent me many times in this little gathering out here. And such treasures as that I hold very sacred to my own being because I know that I have to answer someday from where it went from there. And I certainly want to appreciate, do appreciate and want to express my gratefulness of the loyalty of you people, of, of this uh, thought that you have did, knowing that the tithings that you have and meeting in houses like this, and yet want what little you have to go the best of your knowledge to the support of the, of the ministry. Then from there on, I have to be responsible for it, and I want to be a good steward to our Lord. And when I have to answer it that day for what we did on earth. Now, there's one thing back here we're not be bothered too much with the roar of traffic. <laughs> and uh, that's uh, good. And so now I just hardly know how to say this, but... I wish we were holding a revival back here where we'd have several days of it because this way you just come in and say, how do you do? I'm glad to meet you and uh, speak a few moments about the Lord and gone again. I'm supposed to be in Tucson at 1.30. And how that it, we just meet here like that and shake one another's hands and say, how do you do? Glad to have met you and take off. But you know, I think of a day when we will meet where we won't say goodbye. We won't say, it's nice to see you, hope to come back again. Or we would count here maybe a couple hours together there. We, can, we might sit down and talk for a million years if there's such a thing as time. And we won't, won't be any less time than it was when we sat down. See? It's just eternity. There's no, there's no end to it. And to think of the time that uh, out and like that, and when we'll walk down through the corridors of God's great paradise and the angels singing anthems, and, and now is the time where we have to, to fight to, uh, to win the battle and to overcome the things of the world. And there, we'll, uh, well, there won't be any fight. The, uh, the last prayer will be made. They won't have to have prayer meetings no more. There'll be no more a place for the people to get saved. There'll be no sickness to be healed. And uh, it'll just be one great glorious thing. And what could we as human beings this morning, what, what could we promise? What could we look at anything to be any greater than to look into that promise of that time? See? Uh, we think of here, I look at the changing of the ages from little nursing babies on their mother's laps to the little school boys, the teenage girls and boys, and then the middle age, and then the elder. Thing. And uh, the school boy last year was on his mother's lap, a nursing baby. Thing. And the teenage entered school just last year, seemingly. And the middle age was a teenage, and then the old age just, oh, the, it's just like a vapor that flies into the earth and falls away. As Solomon said, I believe it was, it's like a flower. He rises up and it's cut down and wastes away. And we, we want to make benefit of what time we are here. So now let us speak to him now as we bow our heads in prayer. And if there would be any one here that would like to be remembered in prayer, for instance, like being sick or have need, if you would just make it known to God in your heart, say, now, Lord, I've entered to, to ask in this uh, petition, and if you would just, so I would know, kind of, if you just raise your hand up and just, like I say, remember me. The Lord bless you richly. Almighty God, who formed the heavens and the earth by thy word, we have assembled here this morning to speak of this Word and of the Great One who is the Word. We thank Thee for this grand privilege of coming back at the backside of the desert. It was there one day where a burning bush uh, drawed the attention of a runaway prophet. And there he was commissioned anew 
and was sent, which became a great deliverer of the people of that day, of God's heritage that was in bondage. Oh, great God, won't you come to the back side of the desert this morning with us? As we know, you're in great cathedrals and around the world, but knowing that you are the infinite God, and there's no place too small or no place, or no matter how well we're scattered across the face of the earth, yet your ominous present can be everywhere at all times. We thank thee for this. And in this assembly this morning, we thank thee for our brother and, and uh, his little flock here and for their courage and loyalty to the cause that of God in the earth today. And we ask your blessings upon them. And may, as long as there is a desire and heart for Christ, may there always be a messenger somewhere to grant, bring the message to that hungry heart. And we pray, Heavenly Father, for the need of those people who raise their hands just now. You know what was pulsating under their hand, around their heart. They had a need. If it's sickness, Lord, you who taken Paul, share it. It was just spoke of just a matter of hours ago when he was laying between death and life with a raging fever that all the medical science could not stop. And yet one small word of prayer stopped the fever immediately. Your Jehovah God show that you're just as well represented and just as real today here on the backside of this desert as you was the days with Moses at the backside of the desert there. We thank Thee because I know that You will hear prayer. And we come to Thee most humbly and most sincerely, knowing that it would be wrong to ask You things that we're just imagining in our mind. We want to be earnest and dead sure that what we're asking, we must believe it and, and know that it is God's will to give it to us because we have solved it out in our hearts with all we know, Lord. So I pray that you will heal every sick person that's here this morning. Save everyone that's lost. Grant it. May something be said or done today that will cause them in the place where they're seated or standing around the walls or wherever it may be that the anchoring faith of God will move into their hearts and that will settle it once for all. Grant it, Father. Bless the brothers. Let's have the home here for the service. Now speak to us through thy word, for that's why we're here, Lord. We love the fellowship with each other, but yet it's you that we want, Lord. We can go out under the tree somewhere and sit down and talk with each other. But here we are assembled to find favor with you. Won't you meet with us now, Lord? We play an openness seat in our heart that you to be thrown today to talk to us and tell us of the needs that we have. And your love expressed to us as we express our love to you. This we ask in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> there, if there's someone back in there that wants to sit down, I see some uh, chairs here that you could be assembled and want to be more comfortable. Now, these uh, times that we're living in is tremendous times. And yesterday while I was thinking of what would I uh, say today, you know, and we've looked forward to coming down here, and uh, what would I say when I come down to the little prayer meeting, and I asked the Lord to help me, and, uh, and I picked up a few notes on uh, Scripture here that I'd like to express to you people uh, this morning while we're waiting for the Lord's blessings, and we pray now that you'll open your heart and understand and the least faintest little knock of Christ at the heart. Remember, you if you're not a believer and never have accepted Christ yet, this will be the grandest thing that ever happened to you will be gathered in this home this morning. That when that knock come to your heart, if you'll accept it, it's a door to life to turn it away as death. And that's why we're here this morning to show to you that there is an open door to every believer that can believe. 
Now, I want to read from the book of the Revelation of Jesus Christ, the 15th chapter. I want to read a portion, the first four verses of the 15th chapter of the book of the Revelation. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having seven last plagues, for in them is filled up with the wrath of God. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire. And them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name stood on the sea of glass, having harps of God. And they sang the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only are holy, and all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. And if the Lord will, I would like to take a <coughs> text from that to call it <coughs> a V-Day, Victory Day as we symbolize that, a complete victory. These people that in the chapter that we have just read had just gotten the victory. Uh, I think that the word victory is a great word in the English uh, language. It means that you have, you have defeated the enemy and you've overcome and you are a a victor, holding victory. And we sang songs and cheer and a victory. And here we find that there was something these people had come to this sea of glass and mingled with fire. And they had gotten the victory over the beast, over his image, over the mark and the letter of his name. All these things, they had gotten the victory over them and were victors standing on the other side on the sea of glass, mingled with fire, singing the songs of praise to Almighty God. Now, to speak of victory and V-Days and so forth, it brings us back to the thought of war when we think of V-Day because just recently in the last few years, we come to a, a, a day that we called V-Day of the war, where they gotten the victory over the enemy. And it's too bad that we have to think it, but the world has been soaked with human blood uh, ever since the blood of righteous Abel, the first human blood to strike the earth, was righteous Abel. And he... Uh, the reason he had to shed his blood was because it, he had been right with God. And uh, God had accepted his, his uh, atonement that he had, uh, by faith, had offered to God this lamb. And his jealous brother, uh, being jealous of him, uh, slew righteous Abel. And that same reason has just about caused the shedding of all human blood upon the face of the earth, and the old earth is certainly soaked with it. Of all across the world, human blood. We, there's a reason for that. There's some reason that they would be that this human blood was shed, and we find that the first reason was because of jealousy. It that Cain was jealous of Abel because that God accepted Abel's sacrifice. And Hebrews 11 tells us that, that, that Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than that of Cain, and God testifying by it. And um, Cain, of course, being jealous of this because his sacrifice was rejected and Abel's accepted. And Abel did this by faith. 
The Bible said that he did this by faith, seeing that that uh, the two boys trying to find favor with God to come back because they know that they were just fresh from the garden of life, and they had fell on the other side by the transgression of their parents, had made them subjects to death, just like we all stand this morning, subjects to death. And they wanted to know how to get back into that place where they could uh, uh, find life again. And in doing so, they, they were trying to find favor with God. And Cain offered a beautiful sacrifice of flowers and the fruits of the field or whatever it was he put up on the altar. But Abel, by spiritual revelation, revealed to him that it was not the fruit of the field that caused the death. It was blood that caused the death. So he offered back blood of an innocent substitute, and God accepted it. And that has been God's uh, propitiation for our sins ever since that very day. No other way, because if he had accepted on any other basis, then we'd had to come to that basis to be to find favor with God, but God accepted only the innocent blood of an innocent subject. See? And therefore, if the beauty and the big places would have been God's acceptance, today we'd have, we would have wondered, would he come back on the backside of the desert to this little home sitting here by the railroad track? Would he have come back here and meet with us? But if it had been a great cathedral of the beauty that, that Cain offered, well, we'd find we'd just been talking to ourselves and to the air, but God came on the basis of the shed blood. So no matter today how small we are, how poor we are, or how much we uh, would like to be uh, offered to God a greater place, but God wouldn't accept it no more than He will right now because we're coming on the basis of the shed blood of an innocent substitute, which is Christ dying for us sinners. Now... The reason uh, this blood has been shed is because I believe that man wants to, uh, God invites man to look, but man wants to, to show himself. Man wants to look at what God is trying to show him on the basis of him, his own idea about it. See? God's trying to show man something. But the man wants to accept it upon what he, the way he looks at it. But it's just like anyone wanting to show a scene, there's got to be a reason to show this scene. If you say, look yonder at the mountain. Now there's something there that struck your attention that you're trying to ask me to look at that mountain. See? Or look at this tree. See, there's something about that tree that you want me to see. Now, God is trying to get man to look to that innocent substitute for a way back. And man wants to look at it in his own way. He don't want to see what God is trying to show him in this innocent substitute. Therefore, that's what's caused the trouble. Then when man does, as it was, picks up the glasses to view off in a long distance to see what God's trying to show him, he fails to focus his glasses right. Here on the road, not long ago, coming from a trip up in the mountains, someone was said, here, take these glasses and look over here at a certain thing. Well, I picked up the glasses. I saw three or four different objects. Now, you see, I know that there was something wrong with that. See? Now, this antelope standing in the field, there seemed to be three or four of them standing together. Now, what it was, the antelope was just perfectly one antelope. The glass was all right, but what I had to do was to draw that focus till I got all three of the antelopes into one and made one antelope, see? And then that, see, behind me, I knew there was a, um, to be one antelope because that's what I was told. But to pick up the glass and look through it, I saw, say, three antelopes standing there. Well, the glass was out of focus. I, I had to focus that glass back. Uh, till I get it into a place to where I see the one antelope and then the glass draws it close enough to me that I can see what it looks like. Now, God gives us the Bible. Now, the Bible is the Word and the Word is God. So that is our binoculars. That's our glasses. But now when we go to looking in the Bible and seeing four or five different ways, it needs focusing, you see. 
And uh, we, we got to bring the thing into the place where we see the one solemn purpose for God. But man wants to start an organization, run this way, and the other wants to, well, I, don't, I think I can be a bigger fellow than him, so I'll start over here, and we'll school our boys better, and we'll do this and so forth. See, they fail to get the glass in focus. God wants them to see one thing, and that's the innocent blood that was shed for their sins. That's it, Zach. That's the real thing, no matter. We don't need an organization. I have nothing against them. Only the, uh, the, the damage that they do to pull people out and separate brotherhood and things. But we only need to look at one thing, and that's our substitute. That's right. And that substitute is Jesus Christ. And then today you see how we are twisted out in organizations. And they say, uh, the Methodists is having a revival. Of course, that don't mean the Baptists. That's the Methodists. And these are having revival and so forth. And they, they cut the other fellow out all the time. But we don't want to see it that way. We want to keep pulling that focus till we find out that there is one God. When you see three of them out there, you better uh, focus the glass a little better. See, you're, you're seeing something wrong. So we better bring it in and find out there's one God over us all. And he's a God of the human race. And if he's God at all, he's interested in every human being because it's his creation. And he's interested in the children. He's interested in the old age and the middle age. And he's interested in the, the colors of us and the white, the brown, the black, the, the yellow, the different shades of our skins from the country that we come from. And our forefather, he's interested in all of us. He's just not interested in the Jews alone or in... They're in the yellow race, black race, white race, whatever it is. He's interested in the whole human race and trying to get the human race to focus his word down to one thing and say, there is one God, and that God give an innocent substitute by coming, becoming himself man in order to take away sin to save the whole human race. John the prophet so beautifully illustrated be a whole the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Whosoever the whole sin problem is settled right there in that one innocent substitute. But uh, when man begins to get a hold of God's binocular share, uh, he he begins to he looks at so much of the natural. He fails to see the spiritual application that the Word gives. Now, I see that's one of the great things that man does when he tries to look. Because he looks like Cain looked through the glasses, he looked at a, a personal achievement. Cain thought, now, if I can get Abel out of the way, then I'm the only one. Then, uh, see, that I, 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 the other fellow's out of the way. That's what man has tried to do down through the years, is try to get the other fellow out of the way when he ought to be trying to bring the other fellow in the way with him and, and be a brother, you see. Instead of trying to say, oh, that little group just raked them out and this over here, oh, well, they are this or that. See, we shouldn't do that. We should be trying to bring the whole thing to one, per, one solid picture, and that is Jesus Christ. A young lady last night in an interview she said, but she said a minister's daughter had had some kind of a little love affair and, and she'd lost her mind about it and she'd gone a breakdown. Very beautiful young woman and about 23 years old. And when she was a little girl of about 12, she was in Chicago and sitting in the meeting, or uh, Elgin it was, and sitting in the meeting, the Holy Spirit went out through the audience and called her who she was and said, you got a murmuring heart. The doctor says, you can't live 15 years old, but thus saith the Lord, you're healed. And she's never even, never even felt a heart trouble since. And last night she had a different type of a heart trouble. It was a spiritual heart trouble. Her lover had run off and married some other woman, and yet she is still in love. And this boy telling that he was in love yet with her, and his father had caused it. I said, oh, nonsense. He didn't have to marry the other girl. He did it because he failed to have the right kind of love for you. Exactly. But, see, being all wound up into that, the girl sat there in a... And such a stoop like that, she said, Oh, I know Johnny loves me. I know. See, that's all she could see. She lived in that one little world by herself. She'd formed herself in there. And I took a hold of her hand. I said, Listen to me. And the Lord showed a vision. You see, that she knew what I know nothing about. That something had taken place, some 
transaction between them. And when that was said, then that snapped her right quick. And I said, now, while you're out there, look to Calvary. There, you're going out here and started trying to drink in a minister's daughter, a Pentecostal minister's daughter, and doing the things that you're doing, trying to drown that sorrow. Uh, that man is somebody that don't care the snap of their finger for you. I said, look out there to Calvary, girl. That's the only way back. We got to get ourselves focused to whether we live or die, sink or drown. It's Calvary, Christ. That's the thing that God wants us to come back to. And man, in the focus of God's Word, instead of bringing it together and making it say the one thing that God makes it say, we look at the natural side. Therefore, it, um, it, uh, a man doing that, he gets himself into a place that he just... Uh, takes off after the thing that's presented. Here's an opportunity that we, uh, us little group, we can do this and we can, we won't have nothing to do with the rest of them. And, and that, see, that's uh, the first thing's presented instead of focuses in to know that it's brotherly love that we should have for one another and, and to understand one another and to love one another and to worship with one another. They degrade a man because of his clothes he wears or the, or the education he has or the color of his skin or, or something like that. or his, uh, And that, therefore, it separates the people and man takes off after that. It never gives the inward man a chance to operate. Now we are a, we are a triune being, soul, body, and spirit. Now, but when the natural mind, the two spiritual forces that works in you is your mind... And your, and your spirit, see? Now, the natural mind that's highly polished will try to achieve something by his intelligence. See, and when he does that, the very thing when he does that, he throws himself away from the spiritual man that's in him. And there, what causes the trouble? Right there, see? He tries to make it out in himself. As I spoke here not long ago, I believe it's at the tabernacle, that God is so great he can become so simple. Now, see, when we get great, we can't be simple. See, we, we know too much. And we, we got to, oh, it's just got to be this way, the way we say it, or it isn't at all. See, well, that way we miss God. But uh, if a man could get, a great man could just get greater and greater and keep on getting greater, what would he do? He'd just become right straight back again. It's so humble and so simple that people walk over the top of him and not know it. See, the great person that's in their midst. Just the same thing as we do. We, we measure an electron, we split an atom, and we send a, a message to the moon and walk over common grass that we know nothing about. That's right. The little flower, no one can explain or can find the life that hides in that little seed down in the earth to bring forth the flower next year. A common blade of grass. All the scientists in the world couldn't make one sprig of the grass. Not one blade. See? He can't do it because it holds life. And therefore, see, we, uh, it's been said, fools walk with hobnail shoes where angels fear to trot. And that's really true. We walk over the simple things. We walk over God. We walk over a, a archid looking for a daisy. <laughs> now that's it. See, walking over the archid. And if we just simplify ourselves, get down and... No one could look at even that vine out there. What is it? God. What is it? It's volcanic ash with a life in it. Turn and look away. There's a mighty tree standing there. Cottonwood, I believe. What is it? It's uh, volcanic ash with a different kind of life in it. This kind of life made, uh, made a tree. That kind of life made a vine. See? And what are we? Volcanic ash with life in it. What made us what we are? We would just be no more than that. But God put eternal life in us, and then we become subjects of God. Then we're, we're watching, focus the Word then to God. But man never gives the inside man a chance to explain what is right. Therefore, that's what causes the trouble. Watch, we find if he doesn't do it, then what happens? We find that his temper, like Cain, got up, see, right quick. He was jealous. He didn't like 
God uh, to offer His, uh, to accept Cain's uh, Abel sacrifice instead of His. He wanted to go to, he wanted his own sacrifice. He wanted his own way. See, instead of coming over to Abel and saying, Oh, my brother, I am so happy that God has accepted. Now we got a way that we know that Jehovah accepts this way because He's proved it by receiving your sacrifice. Wouldn't that have been the thing to have done? But instead of that, He got jealous. Now, don't you see that same thing today in man? It's just His way. See? Now, is instead of accepting the way that God vindicates to be truth, the way that God Himself moves up on the scene and says, This is it. These signs shall follow them that believe. I'll be with you even in you. A little while the world won't see me anymore, yet you'll see me. For I'll be with you even in you. See, the world, you, the world won't see me, but you will. See? Cain won't see me, but you will, Abel. <laughs> You see, because it's, a, it's the same thing. And instead of coming and saying, well, wonderful, we see God in the midst of the people working. Let's do that. No, sir. With greed, the same thing. And greed, rather. And with uh, jealousy, the same thing that Cain has. He requires the blood of his brother. He tries to wipe him out of the way. Get rid of him. They're nothing but a bunch of holy rollers. They're a little, see, you know what I mean. That's what starts the trouble. There's where trouble begins. That's where the broken vows, that's where broken fellowship separates. That's the thing that breaks up homes. That's the thing that starts the, the wheel of moving towards divorces. That's the very thing that breaks the fellowship. That's the thing that broke the fellowship in Eden is because that Eve failed to keep the focus of her looking on God's Word and listen to the reasonings of the enemy. See? See, if she just stayed right with God said so, that settles it. God said so. But she didn't want to do that. See, she changed the focus of her glass and began to see instead of being just one way, there become two ways. See, she saw, well, now maybe this man could be right. Maybe he is right. Now, we know God is right and maybe he's right. This is just more light on what God said. <laughs> You see there, there's the same thing happens today exactly right back to the same spot. See, you see two ideas. There's only one. There's not no creed, it's a word. It's God's word, God's purpose, God's plan. All other plans are no good. That And Eve did this evil thing, and that's the reason today that God in His Word never permits women to be ministers. See, it's just not permitted in the Word. This morning in our home, we were talking and uh, sitting at the breakfast table early. Uh, we had to want to start so we get here on time, get back to the other appointment. So we, I said, um, we was talking at the table and, and was talking about the Word come up about angels. My little boy, Joseph, sitting there said something about angels. And he said, uh, now, Daddy, he said, uh, 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 the angels, and I said, God is a man, but said that the angels are women. I said, there is no such a thing. See? He said, well, they got Sarah, my daughter, said, but Daddy, he said, they, they got skirts on, said, they're, they're women. I said, that's some psychologist drawed that picture. There never did see in the Bible an angel called she. It was he. Yeah. Always he, he, he. Not, not she. There's no such a thing as a angel uh, being a woman. There never was in the Bible, and there's not in the church of the living God. There's no such a thing as a messenger woman. An angel is a messenger. So God never permitted because the Bible says Adam was first formed, and then even Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. See? Therefore, she said, uh, Paul said, I suffer not a woman to teach or have any authority, but to be in silence is also saith the, the law. Now, in that, you see, now, now, like our Pentecostal groups, it's the grass root of that. See, what they do, they get the focus well. Now, here, here's a woman can preach like a lightning. Well, that's no doubt at all. Absolutely. I heard some women preachers could preach that man couldn't even stand in the shadow and doing it. But that doesn't have one thing to do with what's righteous. See, doesn't have one. Paul said, if one speaks in tongues and there be no interpreter, then let him hold his peace. He said, I can't hold my peace, but the Bible said you can. So that's it. See, it must be done in order, placed in order, put in its place, and there remain ever in its place. See, there you get out of focus. That causes hard feelings, greed, and so forth. Instead of focusing ourselves back with the Word, we focus ourselves out and see, well, let them do what they see. See what they, 
this the way. And all right. Now we find that it breaks up the fellowship of homes. It breaks up the fellowship of churches. It breaks up the fellowship of nations. That same thing. Nations wants to see their own way. Germany wants to see their way alone. Russia wants to see their way alone. America wants to see her way alone. See? And then it, see, that's it. It's the spirit of the nations. You find it. Wherever you go, you find a national spirit. I went in, and they have different ways. It's so strange. If I had the time, I'd just like to skip through some of the nations and show you. When you go, in, you go into Germany, you find a, a military spirit. Everything's military. You have to stand straight, walk straight, cut your corners and everything. It's military. You go into uh, France, you find an immoral spirit. Just women and wine and liquor and, and stuff like that, see. You go into Finland, you find a loyal spirit, kind of like a, everything is honest. They must pay off everything. See, it must be done. It's just got to be that way. No matter how hard they have to work, what it costs, it must be that way. You come into America, you find a big ha, 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 ha. That's what it is. Yeah, that's the American spirit. Somebody tell a dirty joke on the radio and everybody laugh at it. Uh, Ernie Ford or, uh, or some of them cracking jokes that they have, you know, everywhere, Arthur Godfrey and that group like that. See, that's, a, that's American spirit. You find it that way. And then those spirits get jealous of another spirit. And what do they do? They cause war. That's right. Now, you see, every nation is controlled by Satan. The Bible said so. He's a God of the nations. Satan took Jesus up top of the mountain and said, showed him all the kingdoms is in the world. All the kingdoms. In a moment of time, and said, these are mine. Amen. I'd do with them anything I want to. He said, I'll give them over to you. If you worship me, Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. He knew he was going to fall heir to him in the millennium. Amen. See? So he didn't have to bow down to him. He knew there's going to... Now, when God comes again and take, makes his kingdom here, see, there will not be any different kinds of spirit. A German spirit and a French spirit and a, a Norwegian spirit and an American spirit. There won't be that. It'll be one spirit. Yeah. Amen. The Spirit of God living in every heart. That's right. And there will be one flag, one nation, one people, a brotherhood, a fatherhood of God and a brotherhood of man. Sonship. Yes. Then we find that because that people do this and, and cause these great fusses and so forth. Now, see, as long as Satan controls it, there's going to be wars and troubles and wars. Jesus said in St. Uh, Matthew 24, said, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars and wars and wars. Why? Because the prince of the earth, the Satan, the power of the nations, there's a national spirit here and a national spirit here. It's devils. They can't get along with one another. See? Did you ever take a bunch in the Eskimo country up there where we uh, go on dog sleds? Northern Alaska and way up around in the Northwestern Territory. When the, the guy there was tying off these uh, uh, dogs called huskies, and he'd tie one here and one out there and one over here, I said, why are you doing that for? He said, they're so full of the devil they kill one another. See, just, just kill. That's all they think about. Well, that's, that's a devil, you see. He's a killer. and He's just... He, the, the nation just even devils fighting devils see they just fight one another but God is all love yeah, see so he, he can't do nothing but love one another so you see the whole principle base is right back again to them spirits exactly back to the beginning Genesis is a seed chapter and it produces everything then uh, we have in the earth today now we have wars and victories great victories one nation will come in and beat down the other and say glory we got the victory we beat them up and, and then the first thing you know they'll become friends and shake hands and have a trade between one another and after a while another president or another uh, king will come in or another ruler or another system and first thing you know here they are their grandchildren are bite with guns fighting one another again wars and rumors of wars and this other and another over the other now you You'll serve me, you know, I'm the victor and you're the, you're the one that's out and so forth. You just, as I once heard a remark, God made man and man made slaves. God didn't make man to rule over one another. God made man to be brothers. That's right, to be brothers, not to rule over one another. No superior race, no superior nation, no superior language. We have one language, heavenly. Amen. That's right. We have one brotherhood. That's man. That's man, no matter who he is. Why should we fight and kill one another? But they do it. 
Then sometimes a good nation or a nation that's got a system in it is trying to do right and fighting for its rights and the evil nation will come in over it and then here they'll take over this nation and become that and then back and forth, just changing back and forth. The nations has had many, uh, many great national victories that they've tried as they have tried to fight for their liberties and what they hold for their, their own and they have, they have what as long as Satan controls them, they're going to continue to fight. But they have won many great victories, great victories. We could go back from the very beginning and show where nation has ruled over nation and the celebration of great victories and so forth. Like in the First World War, when we uh, had uh, the First World War, when many of the nations come together and met on the grounds in Germany and where Belgium and different ones of the nations is fighting under uh, the different flags, it was called World War I. Now, I, there's two brethren sitting here, or three, maybe four of you, that can remember that. I can remember it. I'm 54. And I remember as a little boy, about uh, nine, eight or nine years old, 1914, let's see, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, I was five years old when it broke out. I remember when they said there's going to be war, and my daddy's about 22, and they had to send him to war. Oh, I couldn't think of that, sending my daddy to war. He'd come up the road. He's on a spring wagon. And uh, had a, he went down to the store, which is several miles below us, and he had a sack of beans on there. And so I said, I picked up the beans. I thought, if them come and it starts any war, I'll hit them with this sack of beans if they come. <laughs> See, now they was uh, just the thought of war, my daddy having to go to war. Well, the, uh, the uh, trumpets sounded and, and the uh, buy your bonds and so forth, and as we all remember it, we'll go over and have this world war and we'll settle it. And then they'll organize, they organize what they call the League of Nations. And then there's going to be a peace, eternal peace. That's all. No more war. In a merely little 20 years, we were right back in there again, just as hot as ever. And another world war. See? Wars. Why? It's greed, jealousy. See? As soon as Kaiser Wilhelm left Germany, then some fellow come in the name of Adolf Hitler and Austrian and got those people's minds all scattered up, which is uh, demon-inspired, that they could whip the world. And they and uh, there you are. See? It's devil against devil again. You see, like that. And the innocent subjects of those nations that it just lead one another to war, to war, to war, and it's just been that way all along. Now... Now we find out, then the next thing you know, another war come up now again. The whole world went to war again with better instruments and better planes and bigger bombs. And they fought and bled and died and starved and froze and everything else. War, war, war. Then there come a day, what we call the V-Day. There's where I draw this text from, that V-Day, Victory Day. That was the day that they took the victory. And there were the... The armies took the victory over other armies. V-Day. Now, there was a D-Day, and then there was a V-Day. The D-Day is when they went in to fight. The V-Day is when uh, a peace was signed. When uh, Germany and the rest of the, their allied nations and all surrendered to the, 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 to the other nations. And what did we do? At V-Day, we sang songs, we screamed, we threw our hats in the air, we shot the guns in the air, we cried, we blowed whistles, we beat drums, we, we played music, we, we beat one another on the back. What was it? It was a victory. Oh, we had the victory. How these, why we felt we have won, we have won, the flags went up and the trumpets sounded, and oh, what a time we had. Victory, 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 we won. And it was a great thing. It brought peace to the, to the uh, Christian nations, the so-called. And um, we had a little time of breathing. Some of the boys that was living come back home and so forth. But many great them days has been, many of them and great wars. But you know, all along where there has been that kind of a battle fought, there has also been God's believing people has had many great V-Days, too. Oh, yes, there's been on both sides. Where the glasses focused and went to the natural side with V-Days, also where it focuses into the Word and the Scripture, it brings another V-Day sometime. We've had many of them, great battles. Um, 
against our enemy. And God has had great man out here that's standing at the front who's been able to, to capture by the Spirit of God the thoughts of the people and throw it into the kingdom of God down there and come out victorious. We fight it every day. Every Christian fights a battle every day. We're in a warfare right now going on constantly within us between right and wrong. Shall we receive it? What shall we do? Shall we bow to the world? Shall we give up this thought that we got? And if we sit, focus it, take it from Genesis to Revelation, she's thus saith the Lord each time right down through there. We can't give it up. We can't compromise with the rest of them. We just can't do it. We've got to stay here. That's all. No matter how great the enemy is and how much machinery he's got against us and how many organizations and how many of this that there, we yet we have pulled this focus of God's word to we find that there's one thing and that's the blood of Jesus Christ and he's the same yesterday, today and forever. Therefore, don't make any what anybody else says that say the days of miracles is past. There's no such a thing as divine healing. There's no baptism of the Holy Ghost and the baptism in the name of Jesus Christ. That was for the disciples only. And all these things they try to focus off of it. Still, it focuses right back to the Word and nobody can say it's not there. Amen. That's right. So we're in a warfare. And God's heroes has always had warfare. And you little church, remember back here, you're a part of that unit. You're an outpost back here. Uh, you know what an outpost is? You should by being some of it right here by you. So you're an outpost back here to a place to, to keep up the banners, to do what's right, to still claim Jesus Christ is the only hope of the world. Not the Methodist church, the Baptist church, the Presbyterian idea, Catholic or Jewish or whatever it might be, race, clan or color. That's not it. It's Jesus Christ. See? He is the one. He's our victor. He is the one. He's the chief captain of the move. This is his orders. We got to carry out orders. How could you ever, some of you boys served in the war. How could you ever, uh, the captain give an order and you turn around and do something backwards? Why, you mess the whole army up. That's right. You throw it into a riot. You got to carry out the orders. The only way you can do it is focus it and see the purpose. What it's all about. All right. We, uh, have uh, had many great battles, spiritual battles, many great V-Days that the church has had. I mean the church, the body of Christ. I'm not talking about the organization system now. I'm talking about the body of Christ. The body of believers down through the ages has had many great V-Days. We talk about we've had several wars, wars and rumors of wars and V-Days and V-Days and V-Days. And it'll finally wind up into the great battle of Armageddon. That'll be the last of it. When she comes to the battle of Armageddon, that'll settle the whole thing. Just before the great millennium, the Armageddon is to clean off the earth. She repurifies herself with this atomic blowing and the volcanic ash and thing. Sinks this soaked blood of man and upon the earth and sin and crime. She sinks beneath the earth and the volcanic blaze out again and renews and cleans the earth for the great millennium. He cleans his church during that time for a people to live here. Amen. I, say, I like that. Yes, sir. There's coming a time when it'll be great. Now, great V-Days. We think of the times. Let's just go back. we got a few minutes now to think of some of the warriors. Let's go back and think of one of the... Well, we could go way back. But let's just go back as far as Moses. Moses had a time that he went out in a great warfare because the church in itself had long forgotten victory. That's what's the matter with the church today. We've too long forgotten that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. We forgot that God's a healer can make the sick well. Amen. We forgot that the baptism of the Holy Ghost is poured out upon the disciples and given from generation to generation for anybody whosoever will could come. Amen. We've forgotten that long, long ago. So had Israel forgotten. They become satisfied down in Egypt and then become slaves. And now... Here was Moses that went out within his own intellectual affair to, or uh, intellectual achievement to try to, you know, under a military force to bring out Israel and failed to do it. But just a word from God on the backside of the desert boiled the whole thing up again. What happened to Moses? He got his glasses focused. God's only purpose wasn't to marry this beautiful Ethiopian colored girl back there and, and to settle down and have uh, children and, and raise his father-in-law sheep, but his... Mission was, was to deliver the children of God out from under that bondage. 
That was his commission. That's what he was born for. And each one of us is born for something. We just wasn't put here for nothing. That mountain never happened out there just to be. That tree was put there for a purpose. Everything's for a purpose. It's got to serve. And we are here for a purpose. Maybe it's to testify to one person. And get them saved. And now that might come a preacher will send a million souls to Christ. Look at Dwight Moody's conversion and many of those. You see, just one little old woman with a, a little old wash woman uh, with a message on her heart to do something for God. And she rented an old livery stable and got a minister to come down and preach. And nobody but a little old boy with the hair hanging down his neck. And his daddy's sapander's own went down there and knelt down to all of that night. Dwight Moody that sent a half a million souls to Jesus Christ. That woman had something to do. She's, it was for a purpose. She was made a washwoman for a purpose. Don't despise where God's got you, but serve your purpose. There's coming a great victory day in one of these days where the battle is over. Now, notice Moses, he went down after got his glasses focused and seen that it was God's program, what he was to do. He went down. He fought hard. He had many great battles, but one of his great trying battles I'd like to... To bring it when he had achieved by showing signs and wonders by uh, different things that God had showed him to speak the word and it would become material and happen. Same thing we have today speak the word over the sick and watch it heal and do these other things that God's word spoke through human lips. If you say to this mountain, Be moved and don't doubt, but believe what you said will come to pass, you can have what you said. Jesus said so. Now we believe that and hold to it and take it and believe it. And now Moses had done that. And he got down there and God had proved the being with him. But after getting him all together, God, it seems like the Christian life, if the fellow is not absolutely centered on Christ, the Christian life seems like oh, so many disappointments. But those disappointments are, are God's divine will happening for us. Now, it don't seem like it would be that. But it's God's way of doing things. He lets us hit the river to see what we'll do. Moses led the children of Israel right in the path of duty and Pharaoh's army behind him and the dust boiling from a, a half a million men in arms. And here was two million helpless Jews with nothing standing there. Men, women, children, and so forth. And the Red Sea had him cut off. The Dead Sea had him cut off. He, there's no place to go. See? But Moses had a V-Day when he prayed through. <laughs> He went and began to cry out to the Lord. And the Lord said, Why are you crying to me? I commissioned you to do it. Speak to the children that they go on in the line of duty. Hey, man. There you are. Don't cry out to me. You're commissioned to take these people over there. Just speak to them that they go forward. Stay straight in the path of duty. Hey, man. What a courage that ought to be for the sick person. What a courage that ought to be for the backslider. Turn yourself around and start back. Stay in the line of duty. God's business to open up Red Seas. It's God's business. You just speak and move forward. That's all you have to do. And Moses, that great V-Day was at the sea down there. Oh, what a V-Day that was for Moses and for the children of Israel who obeyed the voice of their prophet. When they spoke and went forward, Moses said, Haven't I you seen ten miracles already? And still you doubt. And he started walking towards the sea with that stick in his hand. And God sent in a wind over the night and blowed that sea from one side to the other and walked across on dry land. A V-Day. Look here. They stood. Even our text today said that they stood and sang the song of Moses on the sea of glass mingled with fire. See? See, they sung like Moses when he crossed over and he didn't know what to do. And he got over here come Pharaoh's army trying to impersonate. Well, the things that he was doing, carnal comparisons. And what happened? The sea fell in and drowned him, everyone. And he saw the dead taskmasters. Miriam grabbed a tambourine, and down the bank she went, beating his tambourine. And the daughters of Israel followed her, shouting and beating tambourines and dancing. And Moses sung in the Spirit. Now, that ain't an old-time Holy Ghost meeting. I've never seen one. These Egyptians that you look at today, you will never see them again. Man, what a day. It's all over. Someday there will come another V-Day for the Christian, too. That's right. Notice, Joshua 
had a V-Day at the river, too. Joshua had a V-Day at Jericho. He certainly did. There where he had crossed, he had a V-Day first at the river. There he is in the month of April, probably a mile across Jordan was, because up in top of the mountains up there, there's snow melting, and all over the plains, the river was spread, and no doubt the enemy would have said, now, God is quite a, a general, isn't he? Lead his army right up here to the time of spring, when the river's the worst, when it's the worst time to cross, and then lead his army up here and let him to cross. No, God lets disappointments happen to show victory. Oh, if we could only see that. You could only see that these things, it seems to be so burying you and upsetting you. They're trials. There are things to stand still, focus your glasses on the Word of God and speak the Word and then just walk forward. That's all there is to do it. We get to a time we say, God, I don't know what to do. I'm up against it. Speak the Word. Lord, I believe. And just start walking forward. God does the opening up of the sea. You just keep walking. And now, we find out that Joshua, right at that time, he prayed and the Lord told him that what would happen. And he had a V-Day. He overcome. Then when he overcome the river and got on the other side, what did he do? He put the ark, which the word was in the ark, he put that first. Then the singers and so forth come behind it. But the ark went forth first. When Israel went to battle, the first thing went forth was singers. And singers went forth singing. Then they blow trumpets and so forth. Then the ark moved up. Then when the ark moved up, then they set the ark down and the, the battle started. Notice. But now in this, when Joshua took the word first and put the word first, he crossed down. A, God had told him, as I was with Moses, so I'll be with you. I'll not fail you. I'll be with you. No man's going to stand before you all the days of your life. I'm going to be right there. Don't fear what's going to take place. I'll be right there. Then what? With a commission like that, what could Joshua do but put the word first? Amen. Amen. There you are. With a commission from God, put the word first. And it brought a V-Day. Oh, it's got to come. That's all. He put the word first. And what happened? The ark went down first to the water, and when it did, the sea opened up, the river rather, and they crossed over. Then what's he going to do after he gets over there? What's the next thing that's going to take place? When he gets over there on the other side, then he finds out they're all walled in because of the fear of him when he comes over. But he met the chief captain one day, and he had another V-Day. He told him exactly what to do, and the walls of Jericho fell down. How's he going to do it? The natural man looking through the glass there said, Now here, you brought me over here, and here I am. Look at the opposition. Well, they're all on the inside with their slings. If we ever get close to that wall, woe unto us. They got rocks laid in there, the big slings. They got spears. They got bows. They got everything laying in there, and they just cross. But see, Joshua put God first. And when it, it isn't how you're going to get there, that's up to God. Just keep on moving. Following the word, he said, march around in seven days. And on the seventh day, march seven times. And on that the last time around, sound the trumpet. God's placed and take the natural away. And the spiritual moved in, and the walls fell. And they went right straight up and took the thing. Yes, sir. God had a V-Day then. Abraham had a V-Day. After being promised so long for this child, God tested him for his love and his loyalty to whose seed we are, if we believe God. And Abraham had a V-Day. When was it? The day that he left um, uh, the land of uh, the Shinar Plains? Not exactly. He crossed over, that's right, uh, the Euphrates and come on this other side to sojourn. That was a good day. That still was a kind of a... But his main V-Day was up on Mount Jara. <laughs> when he got up there that day when God gave him the final test, when he had his only son, he said, Now, Abraham... Take him up there to that mountain and offer him up for a sacrifice. I've made you a father of nations. Here is the only thing that you've got to make you a father of nations is through this son. I want you to kill him. Oh, you see it? Destroy everything. Destroy the very purpose. Here you are, Abraham. You're about 114, 15 years old now. And you waited for 25 years for the baby. And now the boy's 15, 16 years old. And I want you to take him up and kill him. So that I can make you a father of nations. Oh, my. Yes. Abraham never moved. He never, never quivered at the word of God. He said, yes, Lord, here I go. 
picked up the wood and took Isaac right at the top of the hill just exactly in obedience. Why? He put the commandment of God first. How is he going to be a father of nation when he's only got one son and over a hundred years old now? How did he do it? Because this, he said, uh, he perceived that if God was able to give him Isaac as one from the dead, he could also raise him up from the dead again. Now, friends, the God that has raised us from the things of the world and the corruption of this earth, can He much more give us eternal life and put us in a land where there's no death? See? We look at these little trials and we think they are something. Well, they're nothing but a little testing time. See? God tested Abraham. But when he got his V-Day, it's when he went up there in obedience to the Word. I uh, like to say, they I know... I heard a minister a while ago read Acts 2.38, but he missed out. He said, and uh, Peter said that they must be baptized, and then, then they would receive the Holy Ghost. Failed to read the rest of it. Why? See? Um, organizations thought the very thing. Now, you get the idea? See, why do you do that? Why makes you bypass those things? If the Bible says that, read it right down the way it says it and say the same thing the Bible says. Well, that's when you got your focus back right. See? Come back to what the Word says. Now, we find out that the... You get your, your, you're out of focus there. Now, Abraham had had his focus right because God said, I'm going to make you a father of nations when he was 75 years old and Sarah 65, and he believed God. He, what did he do? He put his focus on what thus saith the Lord was. Yes, sir. And he walked right straight with that, what thus saith the Lord was. Day after day he walked, year after year he walked. Confessing anything contrary to that was, wasn't right. No, sir, it had to be that way. God said so. I imagine some of these enemies walk around and say, Father of nations? How many children do you have now? We can do this how I have now. I'm a father of nations. <laughs> That's all. How do you know? God said so. That settles it. That's just all there is to it. God said it, and that settles it. So, woman Abraham, and he finally come to that very, then see, being so loyal, more loyal, more testing. See, so he brought him right back. Now, remember, when God has counted you worthy, when you have a test. Now, don't fail this. To get this, when you have a trial or a test, it shows the grace of God has found, you found favor with God, and God believes that you'll stand the test. You remember he did the same thing with Job. Satan said, oh, yes, I've seen Job. I said, no. God said, he's a perfect servant. There's none on earth like him. There's nobody like Job. He's a perfect man. Uh, he, he's, my, he's my pride and joy. Satan said, oh, sure. He gets everything he asks for. He said, let me have him once. And said, I, I, I'll make him curse you to your very face. I'll just make him curse you. God said, he's in your hands, but don't you take his life. See, God had confidence in Job. Amen. Hey, man. When it looks like everything's gone wrong, God's giving you a trial. He's got confidence in you. He don't have to baby you around. You're not a hotbed plant, a hybrid. You're a real Christian. God's giving you a test to see what you do about it. Amen. Amen. Go on, and Peter says, These stray, fiery trials, well, count it a joy. It's, it's pre more precious to you than gold. And many times we hum and haul. Oh, well, if I just... Well, that, well, that's something God give you to overcome. He, he, he knows you'll do it. He, he's, he's put his trust in you. And he believed Abraham. Abraham believed God, rather. And God said, I am no doubt told Satan, I can just prove you he loves him. That I'm, he believes that promise because I told him that. So he took his own son up the top of the mountain, tied his hands behind him. That, the day God said so, uh, little Isaac got suspicious. You know, he said, uh, Genesis 22, he said, he said, Father, he said, here am I, my son. He said, here is the wood, <laughs> and here is the, the, the altar and everything, but, but, but where is the lamb, you see, for, for the, the, the sacrifice? He began to feel kind of funny. What, what's this all about? We, we've left off something. Don't make any of what you think you've left off. You've left off the fellowship of everything else. Uh, well, you have to have your card parties. You have to do this. You have to drink a little bit. And you've left. You ain't left off nothing. Go on, obey the word. See, that's all. Just obey the word. You ain't left off nothing. Just obey the word. He said, God said, take him up here. And he'd, he would get up here on top of the mountain. Uh, I'm supposed to do something. When I get there, I'll do it. So he got up there and tied his hands and laid him up on the altar like that. Little Isaac never murmured, obedient, the type of Christ. Then when he pulled the knife from its scabbard and pulled his hair back out of his face to take his life, that was Abraham's V-Day. Oh, my. 
when he's tested to that very limit of his only son. Now, if you just spiritually take that to a test when God gave it, the vide, what he loved, God so loved Adam's fallen race. We'll get to that in a little bit. Notice, vide, Abraham's vide was on Mount Jarrah where the Lord provided for him a sacrifice instead of his son. Love, see, love, that day, Abraham proved to God without a shadow of doubt his loyalty. Abraham proved to God his faith in him. For he said, I got this boy when I was a hundred years old by believing a promise. And he told me I was a father of nations. If he asked me to take his life, God's able to raise him up from the dead. My, oh, my. I ought to make a Presbyterian shout, wouldn't it? Uh, he, he, he gave me the promise. And he, he, he showed me now the, the evidence of it. <laughs> Amen. He, he's proved it to me that he keeps his word. Well, he, where did he get us? What kind of a mess did I come out of? What kind did you come out of? Where's our thoughts this morning? What has he proven to be among us? There's no doubt about it. Amen. Hey, man, our, our V-Day is sure. we got to have it. Amen. He's proved it. Amen. Abraham says he proved it to me. I was childish. I was, I was an old man. I was sterile. And my wife was, womb was dead. And we were, she was 65 and I was 75. But God said, I'm going to give you a baby bar. That settled it. That's all there was to it. And Abraham says, I believed it. Then God told him into 25 years of trial. It didn't mean a thing to Abraham. He'd come out stronger than he was in the first place. Still giving praise to God. No doubt God looked down and said, What a servant. Said it. Satan said, Oh, yeah. Say, but I'll, I'll prove that he loves me. Take him up there top the hill and destroy the very evidence. Take him up there. And Abraham went up to do it. That's right. And Abraham, though, when he started taking his child's life, the Holy Spirit grabbed his hand and said, Abraham, stay your hand. I know you love me. Amen. That's the kind of person I want to be. Love God regardless of what takes place. Stay your hand. Give you the trial worse even against your own thinking. But as long as the Word says so, do it anyhow. Amen. Stay your hand. I know that you love me because you're not even withheld your only son from me. Said, blessing, I'll bless you. And said, his seed shall stand in the gate of the enemy and he'll conquer it. Oh, my. He did too. So a little later, we're going to get that seed of Abraham there. All right. What did? Doubts had gone from Abraham. When he heard the real word, doubts left. When he seen God vindicate the word, doubts left. Love took its place. I know you love me, Abraham. You don't doubt me a bit. No matter how long you had to wait, you still believe me. I asked you to destroy the very evidence I give you. Give you the evidence and asked you to destroy it. And you love me so well, you'll keep my word regardless of what it is. Hey, man, that was a real V-Day for God's people. Jacob had a V-Day one time. You know, he's scared to go back to his brother because he'd done evil. But yet the Holy Spirit began to warn him in his heart, return back to the homeland where you come from. You come from the homeland. You've done evil over there. Now I'm sending you back. And when he got closer, he got closer, certainly. That's what the devil's so after us about. See? That's what the devil's so after the bride, the church so far now. It's getting close to V-Day. Right. He's getting real close. That's when the enemy does his worst. So he routes. The Bible said, Woe unto the earth because the devil is like a roaring lion in the last days, going around devouring what he will. You see, woe unto them. The persecutions and things would take place. Hold right to it. Don't you move right or left. Stay right with that word. God said so. That doesn't. Jacob, longing in his heart. Everything seemed to be wrong. He wanted to go back home. The Holy Spirit was leading him. He made a promise to God he had to go to Bethel to pay these tithings and so on. And here, on his road back, he finds out that Esau, his enemy brother, is just across the river waiting for him with an army. So Jacob was a coward, yet he had the blessings of God. God had promised to bless him. He had the birthright. Amen. What a type of the church today with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. With the promise of God's Word to vindicate it. Because you become part of that Word. Amen. The birthright. And Jacob had the birthright. Amen. Amen. 
He had the, his brother didn't care about it. And he had the birthright because his brother sold it to him for a mess of pottage. And so has the church world today sold their birthright. Amen. And thank God we got it. Amen. Amen. Yes, we got it. Amen. What do we care about the union of churches and the League of Nations and all these other things as long as you got the birthright? What the church needs to do is do like Jacob. Pray till you get a V-Day. <laughs> and right, Jacob had a wrestling party. He wrestled all night long with the Lord, but he said, I'm just not going to let you go until I get this victory. And then about daylight one morning, he had a V-Day. He didn't walk the same anymore. But on this side, he was a great, big, strong, fearful church member. But on the other side, he was a little limping pre priest, or prince, rather, a little limping prince with enough courage to fight the whole army. Esau said, I'll furnish your army. He said, I don't need it. He'd had a V-Day. We don't need their organizations. We don't need their, their stuff of this world. We don't need their, to have to tally the things of the world. We've had a V-Day. We wrestle one day or one night. Oh, I remember the wrestle. When I, when I had to die to myself, but there come a V-Day when I got the victory. Then God's Word become right. The Baptist Church to me was no more than any other organization. That's right, I had a V-Day. God's Word's right. Dr. Davis said, why, you become a holy roller. I said, holy roller or no holy roller? Up down at Greensville, I stayed all night in prayer until that angel come in there that morning, that light. I, said, what? I was trying to get rid of the very thing that God gave me to fight with. The visions, when they was telling me it was of the devil. Then he come tell me, referred back to the scriptures, didn't they say the same thing about the Son of God and so forth? I had a V day. No more of that for me. I tucked to the fields and around and around the world. A V day. See, Jacob had this V day. He wrestled all night. But when day began to break, it was a V day for him. All these great victories and things. Get taught about these things, no stopping place, is there? All these great victories is fine. We appreciate every one of them. They were all great victories. The great victories of the wars and the great victories of the spiritual wars and so forth was great. But you notice there was none of them lasting. See? We have a great victory uh, temporarily. Now, we just uh, we found out here not long ago when we went to war with Japan. Why, I, I, in our own home, there was a little bitty gadget. And, uh, somebody gave us a little bitty oh, trinket, you know, a little like a doll. And had on it, made in Japan, the fellow throwed it down and broke it. See? And you can say made in Japan, they throw it out, they're going to 10 cent stores, a bunch of rickies, you know, uh, not uh, delinquent people, go in there at 10 cent store just to act smart. See? Go in and get things from Japan. They want to show their loyalty to a nation. What about the God? Life in his face. See? If they were so easy to run into a 10 cent store and knock over the counters and things like that because they had uh, little dolls and trinkets and things that are made, out of, made from Japan because they were more with it. What about smoking cigarettes and drinking lime, stealing and things like that? To the real army of God. They want to be loyal. How about us being loyal? If they went to jail for doing that, what difference does it make? They want to be loyal to the nation, to the flag. But the Christian's afraid sometimes to speak up. Yeah. That's the reason we need more V days <laughs> when you can get yourself conquered. See, let God conquer you by His power of love. All these great victories was temporal victories. Even to Moses, Israel went right back into bondage again. Always in and out, in and out. We find it. Many heroes uh, still fought on and died. They still do it in wars in the natural focus of the glass. They do it in the spiritual. Heroes fight and die. How we could go down, I got a whole line of them wrote down here, like Daniel and the Hebrew children and them great uh, uh, victors back there that won victories, but they continually finally come a thing called death. And he took them. See, regardless, he went right on. See? Still fighting, dying, fighting, dying, winning victories, dying, winning victories, dying. But you see, after all, man was not made to die. Man was made to live. And no matter how many great achievements he did, he still died just the same. And when we went to the grave, they buried him and that settled it. They marked his grave with a tombstone out there and a sepulcher, and that, that was the end of it. Death swore him. 
that great Moses, great Joshua, the great prophets of the Bible, nearly all of them except about two or three, we know where their graves are, where they marked them. Death swallowed them up and took them right on. See? But one day there came a battle. There come the chief warrior came down. Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And there was an Easter. That was a real V day. After Jesus had fought and prevailed, he fought against every enemy there was to be fought against. The first thing when he was born, he was born with a dirty name to begin with amongst the people. It's an illegitimate child. He fought himself right on through that. Mary having this baby, but Joseph without being married. He come amongst the young children with a name, but in his heart, he knew he was the Son of God. Amen. See? He fought through that. He come to the days of where he would make his decision of what he would do after he had received the Holy Spirit. He come to the day that Satan took him up on the mountain and he showed him all the kingdoms of the world and said, I'll make you a king now. You say you're the Son of God, you got power. I'll give you the ruler of all the nations. Just what the Antichrist is trying to be today. But there was a V day. He fought right to it. He said, If thou be the Son of God, there come a time when he was challenged by the Word. If thou be the Son of God, command these stones to be made bread. See? And you're hungry, now eat them. See? If you're the Son of God, you can do that. He could have. That's right. But there had to be a V day. He won the victory over that temptation. See? He won the. Said, now you can be a great person. You can show yourself what you are. Took him to Pentecostal Temple and said, Drop off. I'll quote the scriptures to you. It's written to give the angels charge over thee at the same time to dash your foot against the stone and bear thee up. Look at that theologian. That Satan there. See? Get thee behind me, Satan. Come the word. It was a V day. He come to every V day. He walked up in the presence of, a, of Peter's wife, his mother, laying there sick of the fever. The fever was raging in her body. They needed service. He walks over and touches her hand. Sickness couldn't stand in his presence. Amen. Certainly not. Then he comes to the place to where there was death in, the, in a family. There come to a place where a man named Lazarus, a friend of his, had died and was buried and laying in the grave and stinking. About the fourth day, the body sets in corruption in three days. See, 72 hours. Corruption. And there come a place where life and death was faced. Here he is, life. There's death that took his friend. It was a showdown. He walked out to the grave and pulled them little shoulders back and said, Lazarus, come forth. Oh, my. That word went forth. It was the word of God. Life sprung to itself again. Back come the victim from the beyond or some word of life again. Sure, he won the victory. That's right. Sickness. Temptation, everything that could be, he fought through every bit of it. A V day, exactly right. Then it comes to the time to when the whole world was laying in the shadows, the regions of the shadows of death. Every man, every human, every prophet, every great man, all these great heroes that he had sent, they all laid back there. There laid Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, all of them laying in the grave back on her. Believing, no more evidence than just the word of God said so. God said so. Look at Job when he was fighting so hard. His wife, even his wife, his companion, he said, even her breath has become strange to me. So forth. He was what a time the man had. The temptations, that even to his uh, Belsar and all the rest of them said, and Elihu even tried to accuse him and things like that. But he knew he stayed with the word. And his wife come and said, Job, you look miserable. Then why don't you just curse God and die to death? He said, Thou speakest like a foolish woman. <laughs> oh, my. What a hero! Even Jesus referred to him. Have not you heard the patience of Job? Job went down in the harness. Abraham went down in the harness. Yes, sir. Isaac went down in the harness. Joseph went down in the harness. Joseph said, Don't bury me down here. Oh, bury me up here. <laughs> bury me up here in my father's. Bury me the way they were buried. The word, the plane they were buried in. The place they were buried in. That's the same thing to me. That's the reason I will be buried in the name of Jesus. For those that are in Christ will God bring with him. You see. So then we find out on and on and on went the heroes, heroes, heroes. 
And here come a time that the chief captain, that had sent them and they fell on the field of battle. The great victories. They come to their V-Days and they won the victory over the enemy. They even, Joshua, with the warning time, he stopped the sun with his own word. Amen. And it didn't shine. The sun didn't go down for 24 hours. The Bible said there never was a man before that or after that ever commanded the sun to stand still, that God listened to the voice of a man. Why? See, he had the enemy all routed. See, they were, they were routed all out everywhere. He had to hunt them down and kill them. That's all there was to it because that was his commission. And he knew if it ever come nighttime, they'd have a time to mobilize again and get together, and he'd lose more men. So he said, I need time. I need light. Sun stand still. Amen. Oh, God. God listened to a man's word and stopped the sun. He stayed in the same place for 24 hours until he fought, weeded out every one of the enemy and brought them down. They couldn't, didn't give him a time to get mobilized again. He kept moving on. And yet Joshua laid down his life and was laying in the dust of the earth. But when this great prince came, Christ, the one that Daniel saw, that great warrior Daniel in the midst of all the troubles and things like that and the great... For if we'd had time, could have referred to him, yet he laid in the dust of the earth. He said, Thou shalt rest in thy lot that day, but Daniel, you'll stand again. Now, the promise that had been given him to all these heroes, the final time coming, the crucial hour, that it must be paid. Jesus had come to the earth. He conquered every sickness. He conquered everything. Now he must conquer the grave. He conquered death. Death couldn't stay in his presence. He never even preached a funeral. No, sir. The widow of Nan come out with her son like that. He stopped it and raised him up. Oh, my. Yes, sir. He proved that he had power over death. Now there's two more enemies. That's the grave out here in hell holding them. Hades, the grave. So on that day when he died so dead until the sun quit shining, and the earth had a nervous prostration, the rocks rung out of the hills and things like that, he died. He went down into hell. He conquered death. He conquered hell. On Easter morning, he conquered the grave. Hey, man, talk about a complete V-Day. A real V-Day. Brought him out. And not only that, but when he come out of the grave, he brought the captives that had been there. The Bible said he led captive, captive. Come up from the grave, bring him with him. All those heroes out yonder. Don't you know that was a great time up there that day when they... When he entered that kingdom, my, when he entered the kingdom of God, brought the captive saints out of there. It was a complete victory, a complete victory. He brought out all the dead heroes. He brought out Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Job, all the rest of them. Brought them out of the grave with him. He captured, see, he come to the earth and he captured death. He captured hell. He captured the grave. Amen. He captured everything. Amen. And now he rises. Hallelujah. Amen. With his saints with him. Now, he ascended on high and gave gifts back to man. What was it? Swords. Put swords in their hand, the Word, see, to conquer. Oh, my. He gave them swords, what for? The Word. To conquer what? Sickness. Sin. Superstitions. Evil. To bring every living creature that wants to live. Bring every one of them to the realization that because I live, ye live also. We have the fight of faith. Let us fight the good, complete our victory. For our complete victory is positive. It's sure. It's got to be. We have the first fruits of it. We have the evidence of it in our heart now. Because we've already got the first battle behind us. We have been able to conquer through the faith of Jesus Christ. We had a V-Day. I remember down there that... About 10 o'clock one night, or when I was down there in that little old garage praying, God, kill me or save me. I went to churches, and they wanted me to come up and shake hands with the preacher. I said, I want something more than that. And then that garage that night, when I said, God, I can't go any further, I I'll die. And when I was there in that old wet building, and my knees just kneeling on an old grass sack, with my hands up, saying, God, I don't know how to talk, mister. I wanted to write him a letter to ask him to forgive me. I didn't know how to pray. I want to be forgiven. I promised that when I was dying on the bed. And he let me, when the doctor done give me up, my heart was only beating 17 times to the minute. And you know how 
slow that was. He said, he's dying. And I heard it. Told my daddy, pull the curtains around me. And there, in that room, that hour, I seen big J's come all over that curtains around me like that. I heard that nurse crying. and said, there's nothing but a kid. See? And here he's going, spinal anesthetic, and leaked through and got into my heart. See? And only beaten 17 times a minute. Now I got home. I had to prove that, that I, I love God. And I, I got down there on that ground and I said, I, I don't know how to pray. And I, I bite on my thumbnail. I thought, I, maybe I, I seen pictures. I fold my hands like this, put my fingers together. And I said, Dear sir, I would like to speak with you. Now listen. I said, I don't hear you. I said, I folded my hands wrong. Maybe I ought to do it like this. I, put my, I said, Dear sir, I, uh, Jesus Christ, I would like to speak to you. I said, Sir, I don't hear you answer me. I've heard other pe people say, God, talk to me. Now, I want to talk this over with you. I promise you I would do it. Now, I want to talk it over. Will you please come and speak to me, sir? Said, no, I didn't hold my hands right or he'd say something. I didn't know how to do it. Never prayed in my life. Didn't know what to do. This little old shed. One day, and then I thought this. I thought, according to the Scriptures, as I've heard it read, he was a man. And if he was a man, he understands as a man. Right. And now I don't know where you hear me. Devil said, "Well, you done sinned away your day of grace. There's no more. See, you've been so mean to the. He won't forgive you." I said, "I don't believe that. I just can't believe it. I believe he'd talk to me." I said, "Sir, I don't know if I make a mistake. If I ain't got my hands folded right or whatever it is, you you forgive me for it. But I want to talk to you." I said, "I'm the lowest rascal in the world." I said, "I I've done all these things and and as I run from you and all, all went on talking like that. And the first thing you know, while I was talking." Across the room come a little light and went over on the side of the wall and formed across the light. That light. And began to talk with a language I never never heard that thing speak in tongues. Never had even read the Bible. I was looking for James 5.14 in Genesis. I was looking up there and I seen that light. And it was talking some kind of a language. And then it went away and I said, Sir, I said, I, I, I don't know nothing about this Christian life. I said, if, if that was you talking to me, I can't understand your language, sir. But if you talk, if, and if you can't speak my language, see, and I, I, I don't understand yours, but may we understand one another like this. If you'll just come back there again, that'll be a sign between me and you that you forgive me. There it was again. Oh, talk about a V-Day. Yeah, I had one. Yes, a real V-Day. There it was again, talking the same way. And I had a V-Day. Oh, my, and since then, when he put the word in my hand, I fought to win the prize, to sail through bloody seas. We've all got a, a victory. We've fought too many victories, and a great victory is coming just soon, right around the corner. Our complete V-Day will be soon when the Son of God shall break the skies and scream with the voice of the archangel, and he shall come again, and the grave shall open, and the dead shall walk out. I think you play my tapes down here. Of the vision and just had her translation, whatever it was, in the room, and went up there and seen those people just the same as I see you. This Bible laying open here before me, and God knows that's the truth. See? There they was, young, just the same as the same as you all been in the meetings, and you realize those visions. Have you ever seen one fail? No, sir. Just recently, he sent me out here on one, told me what happened. You all, all of you know about it. Went right by right there. It was just a second. It never fails. And I'm telling you, as a little Christian group sitting here this morning, hold to God's unchanging hand. You've had a temporary victory, but there's coming a real V-Day completely when Jesus shall come and the trumpet shall sound, the dead in Christ shall rise. And if you don't have that hope within you, don't let this day pass without getting it. I heard a little something a while ago i like to repeat. It come from, I believe it was Billy Sunday that made the remark, there's a boy that had done a crime. I don't know where he ever heard of it or not. He'd done a crime that told him in jail. And, he's going to, he was in, and so he had a trial, and, and the judge said, and the jury come out, and they said, we find the boy guilty of the crime, and we, the jury said, we ask for his life. And the judge said, I, I sentence you to die hanging from a rope until your mortal life is gone, and God have mercy on your soul. And the boy was taken to the prison and put in the inner prison that he'd have to stay there until the time he was to die. And friends come to the judge and said, Judge, we help elect you in the city, 
please, please don't let that young fellow die like that. I just come from Texas for another something like that. A young man and a young woman, and God spared their life just to die about three or four days after that. I guess you all seen the paper. You was with me over there that they spared their lives. So they pleaded and pleaded and pleaded the people that wouldn't do it. So after a while, at the governor of the state, the mother on the outside of the door one day fell down on the door like that and cried to let get in. Finally, the man came in and said, the mother of that boy, governor, is, is outside there. She won't see. And the governor said, bring her in. And the woman in humility crawled on her hands and feet up to the governor and took a hold of his shoes and said, sir, that's my child. Don't kill him. Don't kill him. He's the only one I got. Don't kill him. Said he didn't mean to do that. Just give him life in prison, but don't take his life, Governor. The Governor said, Well, uh, I'll go down and see him. Said, All right. So the Governor went down to the ward. Where was that? And then went in. The boy wanted to be arrogant. Said, Got someone to see you. And the Governor went in and said, Young man, I'd like to talk to you. He got real arrogant. Just sat down, buttoned up, wouldn't say a thing. He said, Young man, I want you to speak to me. I want to talk to you. And the boy just acted like he didn't even hear him. And he said, uh, young man, I can help you if you'll let me say, Get out of here! I don't want to hear nothing you got to say. He said, Well, son, he said, Shut up! Don't you see I'm nervous? I don't want to hear one word you're going to say. He said, Well, I come. He said, Get out of this cell! So he walked out. They closed the doors. So when he walked back, the guy, the, the the police at the ward at the door said, oh, you're the most foolish person. He said, who was that crank anyhow? He said, that was the governor of the state. He said, no, not the governor. The only man that can pardon me. And I run him out of my cell. The only man that can sign my pardon and I run him out of the cell. And as the governor went out, said, he made his choice. So the last thing the boy said, when they put the black mask over his face to hang him, when they pulled the rope up tight, put the mask over, he said, Think of it! The governor stood in my cell and would have pardoned me if I hadn't turned him out. How do we know this morning that the governor's not standing by our cell this morning? Don't turn him away. If you haven't never received pardon from him, not only the governor, but the king, the only one who can pardon you, he may be standing in that little cell that you've been living in for a long time. Why don't you just let him in if you haven't done it? If you haven't made a complete surrender to him, someday you'll find out that this little humble way that you might think is just a bunch of silliness, a bunch of people that don't know what they're talking about, you'll find out the governor's here this morning. If you have need, if you're in a little cell of sickness, you can't get out of it, the governor's here. The governor of the world. He's just, and he'll turn you out. He come. He signed your pardon. He just wants to give it to you this morning. Don't turn it down. Let's bow our heads in that. If you want a real victory now with your head bowed, why not surrender and let the governor of state, let the governor sign your pardon this morning. He's ready to take you out. Take you out from sin. Take you out from unbelief. Take you out from sickness. Take you out from ever what you want. You do it while we pray. Now, you pray in your own way. You talk to him. See, the warden could have talked to the governor. That wouldn't have done any good. See, the boy had to talk to the governor. See, you have to talk to the governor. If you're sick, talk to him. If you've sinned and done wrong, talk to him. He has a pardon for you. Heavenly Father, we are grateful. And I, Lord, I'm so in debt to you. There's no way that I could ever pay the debt of my sin. I was in a cell one day because I was born in that cell. I know what, what freedom meant, and the price was so great I couldn't pay it. But I'm so glad that the day that you visit my cell, I recognized it. And it was... The only one that could pardon, the only way I could ever be free and have victory, a complete victory, was to accept the pardon that you had signed for me. And today I'm free. I'm so happy, Lord, I'm visiting from prison house to prison house, from those that are got marriage scruples, 
those who are sick and fevered, those who are sick and in prison, those who are sinful and in prison, those who have flusterations and doubts and in prison. I'm going from cell to cell telling them the governor's coming right along, pardoning everyone, taking everyone out. Father, you know the heart of the people here today. May this be a V-Day, a complete V-Day. May this be a day that when every one, Lord, today will receive the victory. Grant it, Lord. May every sick person be healed that's in this building today. May this backside of the desert be a time that when the voice of God will speak through the, the burning fire of faith. Oh, God, that little fire burning there of faith, that little hope that's burning, may the voice of God speak through that to every prisoner this morning and say, I've come today to set you free. There be a boy or girl, man or woman here, Lord, that doesn't know you as their Savior. May that little voice speak, that little faith of voice speaking now and saying, Yes, I believe that God is. I believe that He's everything that they say He is. And Lord, let that little faith set them free just now. Grant it, Lord. Bless them. Bless Brother Isaac in here, Lord. We love this young man and his wife and his little children. Bless the little church. Oh, God. That we're so happy for them. We're so glad to see that they got a roof over their head here and a place. And you're, you're so good to them, Lord. And we're so thankful to you. May they ever remain humble and sweet in the presence of God. Bless the stranger in our gate. Bless the visitor, Lord. We pray that you'll be with them. And if they have never received this complete victory to where they can say amen to every word that God speaks, then, Lord, may their faith this morning, if they have in you, punctuate every word with an amen. Grant it, Lord. Bless us together. Deliver the sick and the afflicted. Get glory to thyself. And dear God, may we not fret now after this. And remember that these trials and things comes up on us are only done because God loves us. He gives it to us to, because He's got confidence in us. He believes that, we'll, that we have faith and love for Him that we'll be able to overcome. He'll see to it. And may we not fret and, and spew about it. May we just walk up there and speak the Word and walk forward. The seas will open. The V-Days will come. Grant it, Lord. And may this be one of the greatest V-Days of our time. Bless us until we meet together again. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. I want to say this just before I have to go. I got an hour and a half now to give to Tucson. It's quite a little drive. But I want to say this, that I really enjoyed being here and feeling this, this faith that you have. Don't never get away from that. Let that little fire keep burning and burning. And remember, God speaks in those little fires. Brother Isaacson, uh, I just don't know how to express it, I, uh, how grateful that you have been able to come up here and, and hold the, the group together. May God, my brother, ever give you strength to continue on. And to you people that comes to here, may God ever grant you strength, divine strength, to keep you on. Now, if I guess you have a little formal dismissing in a few moments. The way Brother Ising and I'll turn the service to him. And if there's any of you here that has it's been studying about the water baptism in the name of Jesus Christ instead of the titles of Father, Son, Holy Ghost, our little pastor here is here ready to be glad to do that, to render baptism. If there's any problems on your heart you'd like for him to pray through with you, he's right here to do it. And I have no more and I know him and, and met him and Setting with him in things, a fine, gentle little Christian spirit found in the little brother. And, and I'm sure that God hears a prayer like that. There used to be an old man who lived in our country named Hayes. He was a great old man. He was a, every time anybody is humble and gentle. But, and some of them thought he was just a religious crank or something. But you know, when anybody would get sick, they called on old daddy Hay to come pray for him. He wasn't a crank at all, man. He was just a real man. And that old soldier, uh, um, an infidel, lived up on top of the hill there, had a farm. He was a friend to my daddy. 
my father drink. I'm ashamed to say it, but truth is truth. You know, the Bible is one thing. It tells the truth. See? Now, we have a book called The History. It said George Washington never told a lie. I doubt that. I doubt that. Yes, sir. I'm, I, I, I don't, don't believe that. A kid can come up. You're born in sin, shaped in iniquity. Come to the world speaking lies says the Bible. So I, I doubt that historical point of George Washington. But it only tells the good side of man. The Bible tells both sides of man. Lot was a good man down in Sodom. The sins of the city vexed his righteous soul, but it didn't fail to tell that he lived with his own daughter and had a child. Oh, see. It tells both sides of it. So we must tell both sides. My father drinking. He run with this infidel. And he'd laugh at this old man. He's always making fun of him, old Pop Hay. We call him Daddy Hay. Just a little rim of hair as the old preacher. And they want rain one time. The crops is all burning up. And they come to a little church, no more than this, called Little Possum Kingdom back there in Kentucky. And when they went up there, they say, he said, he, old Daddy Hay had a saying. He said, Dear bless my soul. A little humble fellow rode an old horse, the old circuit preacher. And they paid him off with a, maybe a a basket full of dried pumpkin, you know, and whatever more they had, you know, and uh, some grease or something. That You know, that's why they paid the old circuit preachers. Many of you people here remember the old Eastern circuit preachers. And one day the crops was all burning up, and old Daddy Hayes said, Well, dear, bless my soul. Actually, you had a little service like this. said, If any of you all want to stay and pray for rain, that God will spare your crops. He said, You stay with me. And the whole church stayed right with him. Pop outside, went over just a young fella, Tuck the saddle off his horse. Put him in, put him in the church because he knew it was going to rain. And that old man got down to the altar and he didn't even come off his knees. So about an hour after that, you heard a noise. He looked around and a black cloud is coming across the hill. There it was. See. The infidel, my dad's friend, that made fun of the old preacher when he died. They had to hold him in bed. He'd taken walking typhoid fever. Many of you people out here probably wouldn't know what it was. Oh, it's a horrible thing. And he fought devils for hours after hours for three or four days. He'd say, Charlie, Charlie, that's my father. He said, oh, don't let him get me. Don't let him get me. Don't you see him sitting on the side of that bed there with them chains wrapped around him? Don't let him bind me to them. Oh, he screamed and he'd hold him four or five men, hold him in bed before he got ready to die. Back in Kentucky, they had old pegs along the side of the wall where they hung their clothes. Anybody ever see a house like that where they put the peg and he had his old slicker hanging up there? He said, Charlie, there's a pint of whiskey in my pocket. Go give it to my kid. And his wife, a Christian, out in the kitchen cried, cooking dinner. He said, I couldn't do that. And they held him in the bed until he died fighting devils off of him. When old daddy Hay, the one he laughed at, when he got ready to die, about 85, 90 years old, he went to sleep. And he, all the children gathered in, his grown great-great-grandchildren gathered around the bed. He raised up, and he had white whiskers, you know, and a little rim of white hair around his head, what, top of his head bald. He, which, which said, Dear bless my soul, said, You all thought old Daddy Hay was dead, didn't you? He said, Well, I can't die. said, I died years ago. said, I'm just going to meet the Lord Jesus. He said, Oh, it's so great. said, All you, my children, gather around the bed. He took from the oldest to the youngest by the hand and blessed them. Then he said to his two oldest boys, said, Raise me up. And they raised him up in bed. He couldn't hold his hand up. He's too feeble. He said to his other, another boy, said, Raise my hand up. He raised his hands up like that. He said, Happy day, happy day. When Jesus washed my sins away, he taught me how to watch and pray and live rejoicing every day bowed his head and was gone. Well, we got to come to one of those ends. I'm glad you got a little humble man like this around you. You got confidence in believing God will work miracles for you among you. And I want to ask this little church something for me. Pray for me, will you? I'm one of your brothers too. Not with you all the time. I want to be. You get the tapes and things in here. And I'm out here in a great battlefield. This is a, just one of the posts where we're watching for the coming of the Lord. Pray for me because I really need your prayers. I depend on a lot of times when I hit uh, hard places, especially in the foreign fields, and there's witch doctors and everything, thousands times thousands standing there challenging you. And you walk out there alone. Oh, you better know what you're talking about. <laughs> oh, my. When they can do anything. They can just impersonate anything that God has almost. They can, it's like Jambus and Jambus. <laughs> they can impersonate anything God's got there. Then I remember... Think about a little faithful group. What time is it a day? Way back on the back side of the desert there. Way out of a little old place called Sarah Vesta, see? 
a little prayer meeting going on about this time. Yeah. Way back over on the other side of the mountain, up there in that old cow camp, somewhere like that, they're praying. And I walk out and I say, I'm covered by prayer. Satan, you can't do nothing to me. I come in the name of the Lord Jesus, you see. Something happens. You pray for me. Will you do that now? All of you? Amen. Brother Ike, you can come. You know, I wish I, I could stick around here and go home with each one of you and eat dinner. Take me a long time. And I know you men think you got the best cook in the world. No doubt what you have, see. And uh, I'd sure like to do that. But I, I can't do it today. You all understand that, don't you? you? You do that. I can't do it right now. I'm in a tremendous strain at the present time. But I want to come down to have a little fellowship with you. I want to come back again, too. Come back and be with you. God bless you. Now, Brother Isis, and take over whatever the Lord wants you to do. Now, if there's any of you that would like to come here that's never made a surrender to Jesus Christ, and you want to come here and stand here this morning, right beside this pulpit, where Brother Isaacs and I stand, and want to be prayed for, and want us to pray that God will save you, will you come now? And it, you, you'll have a complete victory today. If, you, if there's any of you that's backslidden, gone away from God, and don't know... Uh, don't know oh, you've lost that fellowship like that little lady last night oh darkness gathers when you get away from God you're on a muddy road you're bound to lose and if you don't have that victory that you ought to have won't you come to this is a complete victory this is could be a V-Day for you for all the things of the world you say I've had so many trials Brother Branham I've just been drugged from pillar to post <laughs> haven't I just told you that that's God because he trusted you you won't fail him will you you might have failed. You might have made a mistake, but you won't fail him, will you? You'll rise up again like a real soldier, grip the sword, and come forward again. We'd be glad to do that. Sure. And if not, Brother Isaacson will continue to speak for you then. If you'll excuse me now, I can get going. Go back to do something. I'll be back to see you again, the Lord willing. God bless you. Will you pray for me now? Amen. Remember, a complete victory and single your... Focus on Jesus Christ. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And someday with your eyes single looking, he'll come from the sky with a shout, a voice of the archangel, the dead in Christ shall rise, and these mortal bodies will take on immortality and will go to be with him forever. Till then, watch and pray. God bless you. Amen. God bless you.